Can you imagine the heartbreak of leading a party leadership convention for 12 straight ballots, only to lose on the unlucky 13th by about one percentage point? That was Conservative candidate Maxime Bernier's fate this past Saturday night, as Saskatchewan MP Andrew Scheer passed him on the final ballot of the night in an exciting convention to replace former party leader and Prime Minister Stephen Harper. What is job one for the new 38-year-old leader? Let's ask. Former Ontario Finance Minister Janet Ecker. Three-time Conservative Party candidate Maureen Harquale, who's currently with CIBC in their compliance group. Mark Tuohy, former Chief of Staff to Mayor Rob Ford. And Chad Rogers, founding partner at Crestview Strategy. And it's good to have everybody around our table this evening for what was really some kind of convention. Before we start talking, here we go. Saturday night, Toronto Congress Centre. And the winner is... And the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada with 51% of the vote. The prochain chef, Andrew Scheer. You heard the oohs and ahs from the crowd at how close that victory was, but let's go around our table here and find out how comfortable you are with what Conservatives have done. Janet, what do you say? I thought uh, the convention came to a good end, as it were, because I think Scheer, he had, uh, he'd run a good campaign. Uh, he has uh, been very clearly uh, telegraphing one of the critical issues for any new opposition leader, bringing the party together. And his, uh, when you look at everybody who sort of signed in, as it were, to, on their second ballot, third ballot, whatever choice, he brought the big tent together. So I think for the party, it's, uh, uh, and he's kind of cute, and he smiles nicely, and that's not a bad thing either. They used to say that about Justin Trudeau, and you guys said it quite critically when it was said about him. No, but Andrew says he's going to keep his shirt on. Yes, he does say that. <laughs> did you vote? Yes, I did, actually. I mailed mine in. Want to tell us who you voted for? No. Okay. Uh, asked and not answered, no, that's and that's right. allowed here. Uh, okay, Maureen, what do you think of the choice? Well, you know, for me, as a, as a past candidate, it was really about uh, 2019 and whether I'd be comfortable putting my name on a ballot with the new leader. And uh, I, I'm very comfortable with, with Andrew Scheer. Uh, he was in my top four, so uh, let's see what, what happens going forward. More on this top four business later, because this was a convention where you could vote for 10 candidates <laughs> at once. Yep. I don't know that many did, but you could. Anyway, okay, Mark, what do you say? I think this was the karma convention. And uh, there were a couple of candidates that had bad karma. Maxime Bernier led for most of the, the, the ballots, but he had been acting as if he'd already won. I think karma taught him a lesson. And Andrew Scheer was the nice guy throughout the whole race. And I'm very comfortable with him. I think Canadians will get to like him. Acting like he already won, I presume, is a reference to the email he sent out on the morning of the event? There was that. There was uh, the tweets. There was just his behavior, his posture. He, he seemed like he was telling people to unite behind him already. The email on the day of, just for those who missed it, was yeah. basically get on board before it's too late. Or I mean, it, it had a kind of an or else feel yeah. to it among some people. Did you vote at the convention? I did. I voted for two people. Who'd you vote for? I voted for Aaron O'Toole and uh, Chris Alexander, only because they're the only ones that I really know. Okay. Chad, what do you say? The outcome was tighter than a vest Stephen Harper would wear to stampede in Calgary. Uh, <laughs> There's an old reference for it's, you. <laughs> uh, it was amazing for, for all of the uh, folks who sat on the sidelines of this very long process and said it wasn't going to be exciting. Uh, they were proven wrong. They had to eat their hat on Saturday night. The room was uh, as taut as a piano wire. And when the announcement came down, you had a mix of screams of adulation and, and groans of disappointment. It, it was an emotional, exciting moment to be in the room. Who'd you vote for? Well, I voted three times of my 10 options. I gave my first vote to Lisa Raitt, who of all the candidates would be the one I would call my closest personal friend. My second uh, preference went to Andrew Scheer, which uh, that vote was allocated for him, and my third went for Max Bernier. Look, so you were, I mean, you had two of the, you had two of the finalists of your three choices. So you're I, happy uh, regardless of which way it went. I think a lot of people in this process were happy, and, and it's the first leadership I've ever participated in where people said things like, you know, I'd, I'd be fine with this candidate if my candidate didn't win. I've never heard that before. Let's figure out what job one is now for this new conservative leader. And the Toronto Star, maybe in something that was not terribly helpful, but it's very Toronto Star, did a kind of a Joe Who, if you remember back to 1976 and Joe Clark's victory at that convention. A lot of people, obviously, in this country have no idea who the new leader of the Conservative Party is. So give us a hint. What does he need to do now? 
to put his stamp on things? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is making sure he's got the caucus behind him and he's got everybody together. And I think that's really, really critical. The second thing is I think they need to be very careful about which issues he's going to now talk about or which question he's going to ask in the House or whatever, because obviously it's the old, you only get uh, one time to make a first impression. Uh, so I think that making sure that uh, the first couple of weeks. Um, and the other thing, um, I suspect they're thinking about it and talking about it, but he's going to have to deal with the media onslaught that every time he turns around, they're going to say, oh, so what are you going to do about abortion? What are you going to do about gay marriage? What are, you know, And that's going to going to drive them crazy because the media won't let up on that probably ever, um, no matter how successful he is. Do you have any advice for him on what he ought to do when the media, and it started at the post-convention uh, press conference, <laughs> where the questions on those topics came already. How should he handle that? Well, you know, I, I think he's got to turn it to what, is, what his focus is actually going to be. If he's going to, to stick with the economic issues and, and the fiscal issues, then really that's where it has to be, and that he's got to continue to send that message uh, to open up uh, those Pandora's boxes. Uh, fatal for him. Fatal. So he yeah. should take the same position Stephen Harper did, which is to say, we'll have that in our party, but no private members' bills on those issues, that kind of thing. Well, I, th I get the sense from Andrew is that there's going to be perhaps a little bit more openness uh, in terms of discussion within the party and within within the caucus. But, uh, you know, I just don't get the sense that he's going to literally open up Pandora's box on those kinds of issues. Mark, what's job one for Andrew Scheer right now? I asked a number of the leadership candidates that very question on the weekend, and uh, without exception, they all said unity, bringing the party mm -hmm. together. Having said that, I don't think the party has a unity problem. I mean, I think most members are happy with the the, the result because Andrew Sh nobody doesn't like Andrew Scheer. You know, he, he may not have been your pick, but nobody dislikes him. So I, I would say that the first big issue, he's going to talk to caucus today. I think he'll have them on side. He's one of them. They elected him the speaker. Uh, he's a popular guy. Uh, I think it is to find out what his message is going to be, to, to figure out the answer to that question, and then to get out and start meeting Canadians. The one question, though, the one issue, though, is you're right, everybody likes him right now. He's never had to make a decision about who gets in what critic post, or mm. we're going to go with this issue and not that he's issue, been whatever. The speaker. He's been he the speaker. He could dodge all of that. That's right. So, so uh, I mean, he's going to need that uh, personal credibility in the bank to get him through the tough decisions that he will have to make. Job one, Jeb? Well, he's got to take on the role of leader of the opposition. So that's going to be uh, the most pressing list of tasks. He's got to move into Stornoway. He's got to hire a staff of between 50 and 70 people. He's got to uh, realign the power within the caucus of, of 98 fellow members uh, of who's uh, got which job and which title and which extra pay packet on their salary at the end of the month because some of these decisions are material. So I, I think for any new leader, the first thing you're trying to do is avoid gaffes. So he's got to build a team to de-risk the operation because he's now a national level personality, uh, a reality he hasn't lived with before in his life. But I think he has one thing on his side, which is unlike a lot of folks who are 38-year-old politicians who've been around for a while, Andrew has a life and Andrew has a personality. Andrew's made a lot of uh, big choices, namely he has five children. Uh, I was going to say, they, smart they, wife, Carrie. they got to hide all the breakables at Stornoway. Well, I love that know. line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, a, that's a pretty big narrative uh, built in day one for Canadians to understand who this guy is and what his values are. Yeah, you say he's had a life. The fact is he really hasn't had a life outside of politics. He's been an MP since he's 25. Correct. So when he tells Canadians, I feel your pain, I understand what you're all about, not really from first-hand experience, eh? But when he and Prime Minister Trudeau spoke on Sunday afternoon, it's possible the Prime Minister imparted to him how you become Prime Minister with no experience in the private sector of the real world and transition from uh, a big reputation and a desire to serve uh, into uh, Canada's biggest chair. And don't, forget, and don't forget that being Speaker of the House is an executive position. Yeah. I mean, you are the one that is running that whole corporation, that organization. So, And he did, from all accounts, a very, very good job. So there is a skill set and experience that will serve him well as a leader. Mark, you're, you're right, he's been a, a politician since he was 25, but he's only 38. That's only 13 <laughs> years. I mean, that's the, he still has life experience before that. And to be honest, I didn't see it until after the result was announced, but the little YouTube video that his campaign put out with him and his family uh, is brilliant. And I think uh, if, if he can get Canadians to see that Andrew Scheer, I think Canadians will like this guy. Maureen. You know, I think for me it's going to be about how he deals with the... Uh, the leadership uh, candidates that were, you know, up against him. And what is he going to do with, with Maxime Bernier and, uh, you know, 
Kelly Leach and Lisa Raitt, and he really has some factions within uh, his caucus now that he has to deal with. And you know, who gets which critic portfolio will be, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, puzzle that he has to work on. Who should be deputy leader? I think Ooh. he has to offer it to Bernier. Has to offer I think it to he's Bernier? obliged to offer it to Maxime Bernier. So? And I don't know that Maxime Bernier would accept, but, I, but uh, I think for a whole lot of reasons in this race, a whole lot of reasons about the McDonald Cartier design of conservative movements and Anglo and Franco, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he, um, that, that uh, we'll, we'll hear very soon that he probably made that offer. I, th I think an interesting choice would be Lisa Raitt. Yeah. Male, female, as yeah. opposed to well, and also too. English I mean, I, I think her her capability and her persona and whatever I think is going to help him balance the perception of the party. Remembering, though, that deputy leader isn't the biggest job. Finance critic's the biggest job, and house leader just behind that. So there's a ceremonial nature to de deputy leader, but in opposition, practically, uh, there are other jobs there that are just as high profile. For well, and, and again, it depends. It depends how it gets mm -hmm. organized, and and it depends on the individual too, in terms mm -hmm. of how they do it. But yeah, finance will be the other critical portfolio, and but it's also international affairs, right? Let Trade. me read this. Folks. Folks, this is, uh, you know, Bruce Carson, who is the former chief of staff to Prime Minister Harper, sends out a daily e-blast newsletter. And uh, I get it. And here was something he wrote the other day that I thought I'd share with you. As candidate recruitment and embryonic policy development occurs, it will be up to the new leader to, as Peter McKay has said, quote, strike an optimistic, inclusive tone and continue campaigning across the country. The party should be fashioned, according to McKay, as a tolerant and inclusive viable alternative to the Liberal government on policy issues. The party must change its public face to regain a sense of optimism, as suggested by Jason Kenney. As Kenney noted, it looked like we were going out of our way to make enemies and not friends. The party needs to address itself to growing its brand in urban and suburban Canada if it is to be relevant and successful in 2019. Mark, how does that strike you as a recipe for the future? I think it's pretty bang on. I think the party now has 250,000 members. I, they should work on increasing that. They're going to lose some because a lot of those people just showed up to, uh, to support a particular candidate, but they really should put a priority on expanding that base. If they can have a conservative party member on every street corner of every community in the country, then they can be connected with Canadians. And that gives them the room to have dissenting voices. We saw at the convention, maybe 15% of the points were social conservative points, and they played a factor, but not a, not a significant factor. It's a small group, but it's a, it's, a, it's a significant slice. But there's room in a big party to have dissenting voices, because they'll find their place on the fringe. When the party gets really small, those fringe elements become core elements, and that's where the party loses track and faith with Canadians. Let me follow up on that in this sense. Um, I guess it's 13 and a half years ago that Stephen Harper and Peter McKay, the then leader of the Alliance and the old Progressive Conservative parties came together, there they are, uh, and created the new modern Conservative Party of Canada. This is a party that in its big blue tent has, you know, spending and deficit hawks, it has social conservatives, it has libertarians, it has progressive conservatives, red Tories, it's quite a mix of people. Chad, how does Andrew Scheer manage all of that when a lot of these folks simply think the other folks in that big blue tent are nuts? Well, remember, they sat together uh, for the entire history of Canada except for one window uh, where the parties broke apart between essentially Western and Eastern movements. When uh, Peter McKay and Stephen Harper signed the deal, uh, they made it concorded about a number of things, not just that they were coming back together to be one party to potentially govern. They said the party would be governed more democratically than other parties. Uh, they said uh, a number of things in the aims and principles of the Constitution about uh, how we tolerate each other, how we uh, tolerate ourselves and make ourselves subordinate to what Parliament says is the norm for Canadians, not what our party thinks. But a couple of interesting things have happened. One, the Conservative Party has become the last bastion for the religious in Canada. So regardless of your faith, if you have any degree of orthodoxy uh, in your faith, the Conservative Party tends to be the last one to welcome you home because the other parties, uh, pursuing modernism and urbanism have largely told the religious that they no longer have a place in those parties because their views are retrograde. We should say the, of the major parties. The, family, the major parties. The Family Coalition Party is out there and available to social conservatives The Cuckoo as well. Bananas parties are still out there. There are, I think, more than 70 register <laughs> in federal elections. There are only a few that are considered serious enough to govern. Um, the, the Conservative Party being a bastion for the religious is interesting because we used to have clear grits in Ontario. Catholics uh, in a rural area were liberals, not conservatives. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all in the 
conservative party now. So when we talk about social conservatives, in our mind, the picture we draw is kind of a, a grumpy old white person sitting in the middle of the prairies. In this race, voting for Brad Trost, they were Chinese Canadian, first or second generation. Uh, so the, the old archetypes don't necessarily work. What Stephen Harper built, his goal every day that he was leader was to leave it intact the day he left. Why? Because no other conservative leader other than McDonald had accomplished mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And he did. He did. He because did. we had a leadership with up to 16 candidates, none of which litigated Harper's. No, it's interesting. Uh, Stephen Harper's name was mentioned a few times at the convention on the weekend, and it always got a huge round of applause when that name was mentioned. There are a couple of other names that I want to mention here, and those names are Kelly Leach and Chris Alexander, both of whom ran on much more bluntly populist, you might even say nativist, platforms, and they both underperformed badly. And to that end, I want to uh, quote Preston Manning, the founder of the Reform Party, who said, Populism is like a wildcat or a rogue oil or gas well, where there's so much pressure from the bottom, it blows the platform. It blows oil all over the place. It could catch fire. It could be a very dangerous type of thing. I think that's the challenge for particularly the Conservative Party. Can they tap into that unrest in such a way that it reduces pressure, but not to get blown away by it? How did this party do at dealing with those populist pressures in your view? Well, I think what we saw in this campaign, certainly through through Kelly anyway, that uh, uh, there's certainly a, fa a group within the party that uh, you know, is very interested and supports uh, what she was she was talking about. But you know, ultimately, there wasn't a lot of room for her to grow. Uh, she didn't get any real significant second or third ballot support. Uh, I think going forward, uh, really, it's now a question. I think for Kelly is, what do I do now? Mm. How about the, that populist sentiment in the party? It, it, it appears not to be too overwhelming, given how poorly those two candidates did. Yeah, but I, but I think people uh, who have been uh, unhappy with what's happening, you know, what they think is happening in Ottawa, I think can find a place and saw a place in this conservative party because it is a, a big tent party. And one of the interesting, uh, I don't know, things that, that I, when you watch the Liberals, when you watch the Prime Minister talk about, oh, you know, Canada is so inclusive and, you know, we welcome everybody and all of this kind of thing. And, you know, and people, the media are going quite, you know, uh, hysterical about, oh, there are so cons in the Tory party. Well, I hate to break it to the Prime Minister, but so many of those new Canadian multicultural groups that he says are welcome have those views very, very strongly. And and the flip side of what he's saying is they're not welcome in the Liberal Party. So, um, you know, I think I think that big tent approach it was a very good one. I think people saw that, and I think it may help um, deal with those frustrations that are out there uh, in the public. Mr. and Mrs. Pro from the front porch are very unhappy about a lot of things, um, and I think the parties positioned himself, themselves well to, uh, to tap into that without getting blown away, but time will tell. Mark, let me tap into your knowledge and experience from the time when you were chief of staff to former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford, who was obviously the champion of what has become known as Ford Nation, the sort of um, angry, ticked off, populist uh, view out there that government isn't working well enough for me and somehow we're getting screwed. That view did not seem to have, well, had very few champions among that list of 13 candidates, and of the champions that view had, those candidates did badly. What do we infer from that? I don't. Th I think we would be careful. We have to be careful not to infer too much, because mm -hmm. let's face it: if you have the time to show up at a political convention or to participate in party politics, then you are a subset of Canadian society. Mm -hmm. The average Canadian doesn't carry a party membership card. Mm -hmm. They don't have the time. They don't have the bandwidth in their life to deal with that. So what we saw at the Conservative Party. Con convention was perhaps a broader spectrum of people than it might have been 10 years ago, but it's, it's nowhere near the richness of the fabric of, of Canadian society. And so the populist vote, the people that came out to support Rob Ford, weren't just angry, they were frustrated because government doesn't even know that they exist, let alone what their problem is, not to mention even beginning to think about trying to solve it. They're, you know, that, that was the, the nub of the, the movement that sort of produced Rob Ford. But Chris Alexander and Kelly Leach both tried to tap into that, and between the two of them, they got less than 10% of the votes. That's right, because those people don't show up to join it. They don't have time to come out and, and fill out a 10-person ballot and mail it in three months ahead of time and figure out a 13 candidates. They're busy 
getting lunch ready for the kids today. So don't overreach and overinterpret what That's this right. says. That's right. They might do better in a general election, hmm. yeah, well, but some, not in party politics. Yeah, because some of the polling that was done on some of Kelly Leach's positions, a lot of Canadians were very supportive of the yes. position she was taking. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's take... I mean, it's quite... I, I suspect most of our viewers have not actually seen the final list. And, Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to bring this up, and let's leave it up for a while, because I want to go through this. This is what, after the 13th round the ballot sort of looked like. And I say sort of because the fact is that there were 12 rounds of voting before this, and after each round, the lowest person had to drop off. So if you go to the bottom right-hand corner of that list, Deepak Obrai got the fewest points. He was the first to drop off, followed by Andrew Sexton and Rick Peterson. Kevin O'Leary, yeah, <laughs> even though he was actually yeah. technically not a candidate because he dropped off, they couldn't get his name off in time, and he actually did get more votes than those other three. But there you see Chris Alexander, who got fewer than 2% of the points available. Stephen Blaney, Lisa Raitt with a very, uh, you know, a, a low showing, which a lot of people didn't expect. Kelly Leach, again, with another bad showing. Uh, Pierre Lemieux, who was a social conservative candidate. Uh, Michael Chong, a red Tory. Brad Trost from Saskatchewan. Uh, he ended up in fourth, uh, entirely on the strength of uh, social conservatives who supported him. Uh, as it turned out, Aaron O'Toole's supporters were, you know, if you can use the old language, the kingmakers in this kind of thing, because it came down at the end of the day to Scheer and Bernier, and Scheer passed Bernier on the 13th ballot. What I want to get, and Chad, I want you to start off on this, let's get a better understanding of how this process actually worked, because this is not a delegated convention where people elect delegates to go to a convention, they have the first ballot, and then they announce the results, and then there's arm twisting in between and so on. Everybody who got a ballot voted all at once for as many as 10. How does it work after that? Well, this process has been used for the second time now. It was the same process that elected Stephen Harper in uh, 2004. We just forget about it because there were only three candidates at that time, Stephen Harper, Tony Clement, and uh, Belinda Stronach. Um, the, the preferential ballot and the, the ranked ballot system, uh, even the, the notion of a mail-in ballot is actually in the constitution of the party. You cannot negotiate uh, uh, this reality of an inclusive, small-D democratic system. It comes from the legacy of the old Reform Party, and it was meant to defeat what they saw as the deficiency of the old progressive conservative party. Too many deals, too many elites in charge, too many brokered conventions. So while lots of folks in TV and media have said, look, we love an old uh, a brokered convention because it was such great television. This process is too technical, too boring, too complicated. Here's what the process does. It allows every single member who wants to participate not only to cast a ballot, but to control every possible outcome until the leader is elected. You want, you've got so a ballot. You want we've got a sample like? ballot here. This is the uh, it, 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 little Which bit camera uh, should you hard show to read. To? Camera one. Just show it up to camera and hold it still. So you've for got a up to 14 names to choose from, and you've got the opportunity to make 10 marks on the ballot. So it doesn't look like the one we see when we go into the polls during a general election. In this case, you mark your preferences 1 to 10 in each of these columns, left to right. Uh, you can mark just one preference if you like. You can mark all 10, though you have to mark it correctly. And I think that was a challenge for a few folks, as these things always are when we're not familiar with them. Um, what is the story of this ballot? Well, remember that as each candidate drops off, their points, not their votes, their points are reapportioned. Why do we have points? Well, because the party also decided when it, when it was formed in 2004, 2004 to weight ridings, because every riding can only return one MP. So they said no matter how many voters exist in each riding, the ridings themselves have to be equal. So all of those votes are converted into 100 points. You have to get 50% plus one points to win. That's why we have so many successive ballots. So what happens? Well, in this race, remember, there's not very much movement as you drop off the people on the bottom of the ballot. Why? Because they have almost no points to mm -hmm. reapportion. So this was always a race that was going to have all the movement in the last couple of sorts. The question was how many sorts were we going to have to go to? Um, for those of us who were watching it closely, I had anticipated the middle candidates, the candidates that were between number four and number eight, were collectively going to have more points. I thought they were all going to do better individually, even if they weren't going to win. So I thought we might even see a, a stutter step where we'd get uh, people pull into the lead and come back. It turned out those middle candidates, their voters had decided in the last month, uh, once the ballots were in the field, to vote for front runners. Hmm. The ballot that we saw in the first sort was one where a lot of people, for instance, Ontario voters that I think were with Kelly Leach originally, uh, or with other candidates uh, like Lisa Raitt, uh, consolidated around Aaron O'Toole. 
Uh, I think that candidates uh, from uh, the Quebec faction and various the Western candidates decided to consolidate between Scheer and Bernier because the ballot had that look about it uh, once we were done. Okay. I'm obviously making a guess there. That's sure. Now, that's the process. Maureen, you were there. Mm -hmm. you, you've told us that you, what, you marked your ballot for four different candidates? I actually marked for three. You marked for three. Yeah. So you did not avail... I, in fact, almost everybody I spoke to did not avail themselves of all ten choices. They went in there with an idea to vote for yeah. two or three or four or five. Uh, as a process, as a way of choosing a new leader, did it work for you? I, I think it did. I mean, overall, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things. Maybe you're, it, obviously for me, Aaron O'Toole was my number one. Uh, you know, it didn't work out for, for Aaron. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, the, the outcome was pretty much where I wanted it to be anyway. So I guess, you know, did the process work for me? Yeah, it did. For sure it did. Uh, I suspect perhaps for... for uh, some of the people in Maxime Bernier's world, uh, perhaps not so much. Mm. Is it a problem, Mark, in as much as every riding is worth 100 points? So it's not necessarily the candidate who got the most votes overall that won, but the most points, which means, of course, 50 votes out of 100 in one riding is the same value as 2,500 votes out of 5,000 in another riding. Anybody have any problem with that? Yeah, some people will, uh, the loser. <laughs> but uh, we've never elected people in Canada on a popular vote system at the federal level. I mean, it's always been representative. You know, we, we each writing elects a representative. I'm not sure that 50 out of 100 actually does have the same weight as 2,500 out of 5,000 because I think they have a limit. It don't does. They? No, it does, doesn't it? Is it purely? Points. Okay. Because yeah. yeah. the provincial one, there's a, there's a sliding scale. If yeah. you have fewer than 100 members, you don't get 100 points. Yeah. But... Uh, so I don't think there's a big issue around that, quite frankly. What I, where I find I was disappointed is that I, I really don't care about the ranked ballots. That's, it's as good a system as any, but I think it fails us when you have 16 candidates. Mm -hmm. Because my ballot, for example, had O'Toole and Alexander marked on it. So my ballot wasn't counted in the final round because I was out of play. Right. Now, social conservatives also voted if they were following the direction from their sort of ideologue leaders, they voted for Brad Trost and Pierre Lemieux and no one else. So they were in the running up until the second to last ballot where Brad Trost placed fourth. But then if none of Brad Trost's supporters chose anybody else except Pierre Lemieux, all of their ballots were thrown in the garbage. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, we, we don't know how many of Aaron O'Toole's voters moved to Andrew Scheer compared to how many of Aaron O'Toole's voters picked none of the above and therefore just mm -hmm. weren't counted. And I think we should because, at least I think the leader should, because there were 141,000 ballots cast in round one. Deepak, Deepak Obrey, who fell off the first one, did poorly out of 141,000. But how many ballots were actually counted at round 13? That's we, we what I want to know. We don't know the answer to that, do we? We don't. And I'd be interested to know because mm -hmm. That, if I was the leader, I would, I would really want to know because I would really want to know how much support I truly have. If I can be counterintuitive on that, the, the advantage that revealed itself to me of the preferential ballot is that it's a great shock absorber. So in a traditional race of two or three candidates, if you're, if you're someone who believes uh, that abortion is wrong and there's a constituency of people who that is uh, a moral belief for them that that is cornerstone to their identity and usually their faith, in this race, they didn't have to hide. They didn't have to do a secret deal. They didn't have to bully one of the candidates into sort of shamefully supporting them uh, to get their votes no, Chad, in the background. But his point is, once, if that is the sine qua non issue for you, and if you voted for a candidate who believes that, and then that candidate goes home and you have expressed no other choice except that candidate that you went to dance with, right. your voice did not get heard at the end of the I, day. I think a social conservative would disagree. Because social conservatives don't demand to win, they demand to be heard and respected. And in this race, they had at least two candidates, uh, some would say four, uh, in every debate bringing up their issue. They got a speech on the last night. Their issue was spoken openly. The, the, the leading and, and ultimately winning candidate has made some concessions, even if it was in fairly coded language, to respecting social conservatism. I think if I was a, a one-issue voter, I walked out of this race saying, I got more attention than I've ever gotten before. But, he, but Andrew Scheer also pissed off a lot of social conservatives because he describes himself as a social conservative and always has been. But he has softened his position. He's sort of in, more in the Harper 
sort of. Well, you know, he has, he has made it very clear he's not going to. Absolutely. No private members' no. bills and on recriminalizing abortion is his that's, position. That's why Campaign Life refused to support him. So I think they're, and in fact, I think they would perhaps be more happy with Bernier because Bernier looked like he was somebody who was more likely to bend to their interests in order to pick up those votes. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out the way they had thought. But one of the things about your voting system, I mean, there's two things you want to make sure your voting system does, is you don't want your a leader elected from one region of the country because that's going to set you up for failure mm -hmm. uh, in an election. So this particular ballot process very much tries to do that. So I think that's a good thing. The second thing you need is you need a process that forces people to buy into the next, second, third, and fourth choice. And so this did probably not as well as a delegated convention would be, because when you're there, you know, you kind of have to vote for somebody else. I mean, you can go home in a huff, but, um, you know, it, it causes people to buy in. So, I mean, this ballot process did to a certain extent. Um, you know, I had four choices on the ballot. Um, you know, so if my first choice didn't win, and my second or third, you know, I've, I've got some commitment to that winner because I sort of chose them. So. The ballot system does allow that to happen and encourages people to do that. And that's I'm, important for I, unity. I wonder, though, Janet, you know, it, it, had Kathleen Wynne won her convention by 50.5% to 49.5%, everybody would be saying, oh, my gosh, is this ever a disunified party? If Patrick Brown had won his convention 50.5% to 495 people would have said the same thing. They're not saying that the morning after, no. which is a, a, a fairly unusual think, well, thing. Well, yeah, because I think what we saw was that people's, you know, people's supporters were buying into the next choice. So, I mean, yes, the SoCons made choices. So did Aaron O'Toole's group. And, and he had a lot of, of, of other uh, um, believers, if you will, and other philosophies in the party that supported him. And a lot of his people went to, uh, went to Shear. So I think it did do that. But how is this not a hopelessly divided party, given that it chose its leader with, where's the number? I want to get it right here. I mean, was it 50.5% of the votes? Yeah, 50.95% of the, of the total to 49 uh, points cast. I mean, that's pretty tight. How is this not reflective of a hopelessly divided party? I, I think at the end of the day, you're going to see that Scheer is the consensus candidate. And I, I think people will, will, will support him, uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that there is obviously a Maxime Bernier's group that, that is still a strong force within the party. Uh, Andrew has a lot of work to do, though. There's no doubt. He has a lot of work to do. He has Bernier's people that he really needs to make sure that they buy into what he's going to be selling, and, and Maxim himself. But they're divided 50-50 amongst those people whose ballots were counted at right. the last right. round. Right, right. No, that's true. Right. Not among and, everybody. And, and yeah. those two candidates, even though they, they almost split the vote, weren't that far apart to start with. The party mm -hmm. was never disunited. It, mm -hmm. it was in pretty good shape. Harper left it in good condition. But then there's the great number, perhaps it's a small number, but most likely it's a significant number of people who voted for neither Andrew Scheer or Maxime Bernier, but are quite happy to, mm -hmm. uh, to have them because after they voted for their two or four or five people, they didn't really care. They were okay with any of the with other But the other thing that I think, too, that you have to look at is the, the context of the party within which this uh, contest occurred. And the party lost, and was, but it was okay. Like, I mean, between, with, with Rona Ambrose's leadership and whatever else happened, I mean, more money, more members. I mean, you didn't have some of the, the uh, I mean, I've supported candidates who've won and lost, and, you know, it's pretty brutal in that caucus room or whatever mm -hmm. afterwards. And that didn't seem to be happening. So that wasn't happening in the party as they went into this campaign. So I think that had a lot to do with it, too, because everybody was like, no, we're going to be adult about this. Well, we're not going to split. Though, there are leading indicators we can follow that the party's pretty happy about uh, that, that proved the process worked. You have 259,000 members of the party. Th uh, three, four years ago, the Liberal Party was telling people the paid membership model was dead in Canada and couldn't be used to engage or mobilize people. This leadership race was the largest, most inclusive uh, of any leadership contest in Canada. More people participated in this leadership contest than any that had preceded by any party in the country. And then let's look at the backdrop of fundraising. In the first quarter of this year, the governing party raised $2.8 million. If you put together the money the candidates raised and the money the central party raised, they raised $10 million. Mm -hmm. Those are some pretty strong data points to say something's working. The movement's healthy and getting and engaged. And a lot of those donations are little $100, $200 individuals uh, putting their, their it's check out. It's not $27, though, like Bernie Sanders. Not <laughs> no. quite. 
Uh, in our, you, you've given me Bernie a nice. Sanders didn't win. <laughs> Fair point. Uh, in our last couple of minutes here, uh, I want to dovetail off that, and Mark put this question to you. The liberals got out of the gate very quickly Sunday night, trying to frame the new leader as extremist on that, too far to the right on this. Uh, in your view, what are liberals thinking today about the new challenger they've got facing them in the House of Commons every day now? I think the average Liberal Party member, and in fact, even those that are planning their campaigns, probably woke up asking themselves, who the heck is Andrew Scheer? Because I don't think they really know him any better than anybody else did, except they liked him enough to, along with the Conservatives and the NDP, elect him as their speaker. So mm -hmm. he's not a bad guy. And uh, I think, frankly, from the Conservatives' perspective, as long as the Liberals are beating the drum that you're too far right on social conservative issues, the Conservatives are winning. Because I don't think the people will believe that. It's an interesting situation whereby the Prime Minister is what? Is he 45 yet? 44, 45. The new Conservative leader is 38. If Jagmeet Singh wins the NDP leadership, he's 38. No, they got to be elect somebody who's in their 20s if they want to win this race. <laughs> my, my only point is the prime minister may be the oldest candidate at the next. May be, he may be the oldest leader in the 2019 we, election we may race. We have three candidates for prime minister who are capable of smiling and appear to like human beings. <laughs> Uh, you know, this end of unlikable leaders, Mulcair, Dion, Ignatiev, Harper, people who just generally didn't look like they liked hanging around with folks. Uh, it looks like that era has come to a close. Well, could win. <laughs> yeah, he could, he, that is possible. Well, you've got a nice smile on your face, and we're happy to have had you here for the first time. We're happy to have you, Maureen, here for the first time as well. So thanks to Janet Ecker, the former Ontario finance minister, and Mark Tuohy, the former chief of staff to Mayor Rob Ford, and Maureen Harquell. Uh, One-time candidate, now with CIBC, and Chad Rogers from Crestview Strategy. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.